there we go. Now, anybody have any problems before we get rolling on chapter five, gases? This, we're only gonna have one chapter on this upcoming exam. And I didn't write that up there, did I? This is exam three. So we can, we can take a little more time on this topic uh, if we need it. Okay, uh, no issues. better. Can't have too many rags. <clears throat> okay, so let's look at um, gases. Let me share the PowerPoints. And here we go. We'll start the slideshow. Try to anyway. There we go. All right, I'm gonna let's see, I need to move, move this out of the way just for a second. That should be good enough. Then I can see everybody else in the class over here on the side. Okay, gases. Now that we've gotten um, the basic concepts of scientific method, we've learned our element symbols, we've learned how to write compounds and name compounds from their formulas. We know the basics of um, let's see, we know the basics of uh, stoichiometry. Yeah, uh, types of reactions and, and how to do stoichiometric calculations. Now we're gonna back up just a little bit because, and the reason I say that is, uh, historically speaking, uh, chemistry started with gases. I mean, quantitative modern chemistry started with gases. So I think it's important for any study of chemistry to have gases up as close to the front as possible. <clears throat> um, and notice that in our stoichiometry, we only tackled problems that uh, were solids or liquids or aqueous solutions. But stoichiometry can also apply to gases. Maybe we did look at some gases in stoichiometry. I just didn't press the point too hard because we hadn't we didn't we don't have the tools to deal with gases yet but that's what we're going to pick up in chapter five so uh and you'll notice the format of this of this set of powerpoints is a little bit different than the others it it's not derived from zumdahl's uh published powerpoints for their instructors um they were kind of weak actually and I had already started building PowerPoints of my own for gases uh, based on a previous instructor's kind of uh, bequeathing of uh, his PowerPoints to me. So I started modifying and, and uh, uh, I like them better. Plus I like the front picture a lot better too. Okay, let's see, can I get these to move for me? There we go. So, um, 
we have a general idea of what gases are, of course. Um, a, let's see, somebody's arrived. Elizabeth. Okay, I'll pause for a second and account for Elizabeth Sheets. Okay. Let's see. Yep. Um, uh, gases are uh, a phase of matter that uh, occupies all the space in the container that you put it in. And it also assumes not only the volume of the container, but it assumes the shape of the container. So gases really need a lot of help to be uh, studied as independent particles. Uh, and we treat them as semi-independent particles. Now this is talking about gases in general, right? This is, these are real gases. We're gonna define what an ideal gas is later because some problems are best solved when we treat gases in an ideal fashion. <clears throat> but for now, gases are semi-independent particles, which means there's a lot of distance between individual particles as compared to liquids and solids. You got enormous amount of space between gas particles. Uh, but they still interact uh, when they encounter one another. All right, let's see, that's not gonna behave, so I gotta do it this way. Okay, the particles in a gas are moving. That is, they're translating from one location to the other very fast, very high velocities. Uh, liquids and solids, of course, don't do so much of that movement from one place to the solids don't move at all. Liquids move a little bit because they can slide past one another, but their relative velocities to one another are very low as compared to gases. Gases are moving, as we used to say in my youth, lickety split. Something's gotta get in the way to stop them. Sometimes that's the walls of the container. Sometimes that's other gas particles. Um, these particles can either be individual atoms, right? Find them on your periodic chart. Uh, in fact, any one of these elements can be a gas. Just some of them, to make them gases, you gotta get them really hot. But some of them are gases at room temperature. Uh, all the noble gases, of course. And then we have our diatomic gases. Those are molecular, those are molecules. So you would have for something like nitrogen, you'd have two nitrogen atoms bound together and they would act as separate particles. And um, that's enough said about that. Let me move on to the next point. Uh, another feature of gases is that they are infinitely miscible. Miscible is, a, is an archaic word for they mix together easily. They make a solution, a homogeneous mixture, two or more gases, put them together in a container, and they always form homogeneous mixture once they've equilibrated. Um, for example, if you're in a room and somebody on the other side of the room opens a uh, container of uh, perfume, then you don't smell it right away. But eventually you do pick up the odor. Now before you smell it, of course, the mixture is not homogeneous because it's more densely packed around the, the container of perfume before it gets to you. But eventually if the room is closed off and you wait long enough, then those perfume molecules are infinitely mixed and uh, homogeneously mixed with the solvent gas, which would be air, which is uh, mostly nitrogen, some oxygen, and the rest is argon plus minor components like CO2, uh, 
well, and other things. <clears throat> but air itself is a solution. So a homogeneous mixture is a solution and gases, two or more gases together are perfectly mixed. Now, just, it's logical actually. I just told you that the distance between particles is huge. So there's plenty of room for everybody. So you mix two or three gases together and everybody's happy. They've got place room to move. Now, uh, individual gas atoms or molecules are real physical particles, which means they have mass. They have different masses, right? Nitrogen, a mole of nitrogen weighs 28.2.02 grams. A mole of oxygen weighs 32 grams. Uh, a mole of argon weighs 38.95 grams. And you can calculate their, their mass. I mean, they, they each have a mass. And each particle, of course, and we've done problems like that where you calculate the individual mass of an atom. We did it, I think, for copper is one problem that we ran. But gases are no different. Each particle has a mass. And each particle is moving very fast. So what that means is every gas particle with a mass, whatever it happens to be, an individual particle, and it has a velocity Each one has a kinetic energy, right? And the units of kinetic energy are standardized for joules. So that means whatever the mass is has to be in kilograms because that's the standard. And velocity is in meters per second. So uh, kilogram meters squared per second squared are the units for joules. Kilograms and then meters per second squared equates to joules. Well, if you take a half of it, of course, but the unit of measure is is that. So if you ever have to do conversions, you just need to find out what's the, what's the value that goes in front of that. Actually, it's one. <clears throat> so they have the energy of motion. You need me? Okay. Now, <clears throat> We say that the molecules in a gas have random motion. That is, random means you don't know where they are. You just know they're moving. And uh, we do that because <laughs> we can't track every particle in a gas. There's just too many of them. We don't have the computing power to do it. Um, so we just say that their, their motion is random Although we know on an individual scale, if two particles come together, if you know the individual velocities and the angle of impact, you can calculate uh, before and after conditions. But if you try to do that for 10 to the 23rd of them, it, it gets a little bit unwieldy. So we just say the random motion and we do our calculations uh, involving the movement of these particles statistically. That is, we, we use average values, we use different types of calculations to uh, say this is the average for that mass of gas. Okay, so we're going to look at, um, but in understanding 
how gases, uh, can, let's say we're going to characterize gases. And we do that uh, quantitatively, first off with laws. And that's the way it happened historically. Gases were investigated first by, um, in those days, in the end of the Middle Ages, around the Enlightenment and, and beyond, uh, they were called natural philosophers. We would call them scientists today. <clears throat> and they investigated gases first. And the reason they did that was that gases were accessible with their uh, theories, the, the, the knowledge they had, and the equipment that they had to work with. So they started with what they knew and what they could deal with and gases were it. And as it turns out, that was fortunate because there are a lot of characteristics. There are some characteristics of gases that are common to all gases. It doesn't matter what the gas is. As long as it's a gas, each one behaves similarly. So that was fortunate that they were able to pick gases. And then what they learned from gases uh, informed their investigations for liquids and solids later on. Okay, now how do, how do we define how gases behave? Well, uh, scientists in a sequence of discoveries and uh, investigations came up with mathematical relationships that de define the laws of gases. So we're going to go through the most important ones of the gas laws uh, in this in this lecture. Now, what we have to do in order to treat all gases alike is we have to define what an ideal gas is and how it behaves. And how far can we take the conditions for our gas before it becomes non-ideal? Uh, okay, so we're going to look at these equations. We're going to um, develop individual equations, and then we're going to combine them. And I'll show you how, how you do that. And each one has its application. Um, just as a side, I mentioned Earth's atmosphere. It's a mixture of gases. It's a solution of gases, right? It's necessary for life. Everybody knows that. Just try not to breathe for for two minutes or swim from one end of the pool to the other. And you quickly find out that you can't do without gas, particularly this, ta <laughs> this gas. So since uh, atmosphere is so important to life on earth, um, we sometimes focus on things that are not supposed to be there or that we consider pollutants. Um, now that's where I take issue with the EPA. The EPA is trying to define carbon dioxide, and this is this is my opinion. Right? I want that's a disclaimer. This is my opinion. Uh, the EPA is trying to define uh, carbon dioxide as an atmospheric pollutant, so they can regulate it. Um, the problem with that is that carbon dioxide was not created by man. I mean, it wasn't added. As, a, as an industrial pollutant, uh, like you could say for, say, Freon, is totally man-made. And it would classify uh, at a certain level as a pollutant. But carbon dioxide is not. Carbon dioxide itself is essential to life. It's not essential to heterotrophs like us, but autotrophs, plants, it's absolutely essential. They cannot survive without carbon dioxide. And in fact, as the carbon dioxide level increases in the atmosphere, the plants become more productive. So I'll get down off my soapbox now and we'll move on. Um, okay, so we have reason to look at various pollutants in the atmosphere. Um, global warming is another issue that I, I take with great many people because uh, of this one word.
I think I spelled it right, consensus. When you hear anyone say the consensus is, and scientists agree that carbon dioxide is causing global warming or global climate change now, the global warming argument fell through, so they had to change to global climate change. But there's no such thing in the scientists as, um, as total consensus. The reason being for the nature of science, how science works, we're always questioning the results of previous experiments. So unless you continue to question, now, if you, if you do have consensus, then what you have is either something like uh, uh, dogma or uh, you dip into the legal profession. And lawyers love to have certainty, but when they call on scientists to testify, they can't have it. Not if the scientist is honest. Um, so I also take issue with um, cause and effect. Carbon dioxide causes global warming. Um, there's sufficient evidence in the geological history that the rise in carbon dioxide over the millennia actually followed global warming. I mean, when the, when the planet got warmer, CO2 rose afterwards. So I said I wasn't going to get on my soapbox, so I'll climb back down now. <clears throat> okay, so um, here's something you need to keep in mind. When we're talking about gases, four terms, four variables will define the condition of a gas. One is pressure. We give it a big P. The other is, one other was volume. Temperature. And the amount. I use little n to represent moles, of course. So if you know pressure, volume, temperature, and moles, you can pretty well characterize a gas. Now, uh, gas in general, I should say. If you want to know something about the particular gas, you also need to know its mass. Because if you know the mass and the moles, you can uh, calculate its molar mass. And that gives you some more information about it. But the gas laws were developed only with these four terms. And the first two that we're going to talk about after we define what pressure is are pressure and volume. And this is in a historical order. So pressure. What do we mean by pressure? Pressure is an intensity factor. And what that means is, and I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again, an intense, intensity factor or value or property is one which does not change no matter how much of the substance you have. Like, um, like density, right? If you have a, um, a block of lead like this, or you have a block of lead like that, the density is the same as long as, as the temperature remains constant. Um, but pressure is also an intensity factor, and most intensity factors are quotients. So for pressure, uh, well, now I use density first is uh, mass per unit volume. So you can say grams per cubic centimeter or grams per milliliter. And, but pressure is a force per unit volume. Right? And the standard, the uh, international standard for force is the Newton. And the volume, the international standard is liter. Right. Well, what's the standard for pressure? Well, let's see. Let's let's get some more information on the board here. 
Um, let me skip that for just a second. I'll come back to it. So an applied force per unit area is the definition of pressure. So there, there you have a formula, right? So if you know two of them, you can solve for the third one. Uh, okay, so we're gonna, I should follow along here so I'll know what's coming. Uh, okay, this, this is a good approach. I must have done it this way for a reason. Uh, we'll come back to those units later. But historically, <clears throat> measurement of pressure was established first by, well, I shouldn't say he was first. He was the first one. Torcelli was a, an Italian scientist in the mid-1700s. He established uh, a reliable way to measure pressure. And he did it first with atmospheric pressure. And all he did was, he just, um, he took a tub full of mercury. Actually, that's not accurate. Like this. Like that. A tub full of mercury. And he took a, a tube of fixed diameter. By this time, they were very good. From the Renaissance, they'd learned how to make uh, long pieces of tubing with, of uniform in uh, uh, yeah, internal diameter, right? very reliable. So he had a piece of that, and he took that tubing and sealed it at one end. You know, it just need a, a source of heat, a, a flame. Sealed it at one end, then he filled it. Well, maybe I better do it this way. <laughs> then he filled it with mercury. Right up to the brim. And he put his thumb over it. And then he inverted the glass and he submerged his whole hand in that vat of mercury. They didn't know about mercury poisoning back then. And then he turned it loose. And what happened? Did it stay put? I mean, upside down? Did the mercury stay in there? No. Nope. Actually, that's wrong. Mercury forms a convex meniscus. So now all the way down through here is mercury. And you got this space up here in, in the top of the tube which used to be the bottom of the tube. So what do we call that? Call that a vacuum. In fact, it's our first vacuum. Because there used to be something there and now there's nothing there. Right? So, well, technically speaking, there might be a few mercury atoms evaporating from the surface, but for all intents and purposes, it's a vacuum. Now, why did it do that? Why, did, why didn't it just stay up there? I mean, wasn't there, if it's already at the top, wasn't there something sucking on it to hold it up? The answer is no. Um, the sucking effect is not popular in the world of physics. There always needs to be a push. And all you have to do is, is study uh, Einstein's approach to um, why planets stay in their orbit and he was not fond of Newton's uh, action at a distance, which pulled on the planets. He said, there has to be something pushing the planets. All right, so that's another topic. But what happened was the mercury dropped, and, but it didn't drop all the way down. So Torricelli reasoned that there was something, it couldn't be pushing in here. It had to be pushing down here because that's the only place that can receive a force. So he said, uh, atmospheric pressure is pushing down on the mercury and suspending part of it up in that tube. And that was his measure of air pressure. He was certain that that was right because he did a couple of experiments. He put his barometer 
in a wagon and hauled it up to the top of a mountain. And what happened? The level dropped. They took it down to sea level too. And the level went up. He and others over time uh, built these barometers and they watched them. They marked them one day and they marked them the next. They marked them as didn't move it, just let it sit there. And they made observations. And if the mercury was on its way down, they noticed that bad weather was had arrived. If it was on its way up, the weather was clearing. So that's where you get high pressure is associated with good weather, low pressure associated with bad, uh, bad weather. Okay, so now we have a reliable way to measure pressure. Uh, volume is no problem, right? Because like I said, uniform diameter tubing means you can measure the diameter, you can measure the uh, size of the tubing if you're trapped a gas in there, and you can do calculations, right? What's the volume of a cylinder? Height times area, right? And area is just uh, pi d squared over four. So you know the diameter, stick it in your formula. So volume is no problem. Now we had a way of measuring pressure. Okay, so this is my little animation for uh, Torricelli's first barometer. Okay. So it's all right there. Everything, almost everything I said. Uh, okay. Now, at sea level, over time, um, the the height of that column of mercury was fairly standardized. It did move up and down a little bit, of course, with the weather, but over time, an average value was accepted by the scientific community as 760 millimeters of mercury. So that's how high the mercury column is at, at the accepted one atmosphere value. So now we have two units of measure for air pressure. One is the height of the mercury column and one is one atmosphere equal to that. So we're building uh, useful ways of measuring air pressure. Um, okay, so um, the air pressure at the uh, Raleigh County Airport, which is 2,500 feet above sea level uh, on this particular day, was a value of 694 millimeters of mercury. That's less than sea level. And it makes sense because we're higher, right? And as you go higher, there's less atmosphere bearing down on the surface of the mercury. Uh, okay, so uh, what would that be in atmospheres? Right, okay, so there's your millimeters of mercury and I just stuck this in here as the denominator. Uh, just so we know this pressure is associated with, and this is the um, FAA code for Raleigh County Airport, BKW. And there's our conversion factor, right? We want a conversion factor. Since this is an equality, we can make a conversion factor out of it. Just put one on top or the other one on top, right? That's still equal to one. So there's our conversion factor. Millimeters of mercury cancel, right? And leave us with atmospheres, which is 0.9132 atmospheres. Okay, um, when, when you tackle the uh, lab on uh, Boyle's Law, you'll be making these conversions. In fact, more than one conversion because we use another measurement uh, that 
you're probably familiar with if you ever own a bicycle or you ever uh, measure the pressure in the tire in your car. ESI. Pounds per square inch. Okay, that's another measurement of pressure. And since we're in the US and not somewhere else, we use PSI to measure uh, tire pressures. Okay, so here's another one, even higher at Winter Place. So the pressure up there is going to be much less, 0.88 atmospheres. Okay, so what if you have a pressure of 1.032 atmospheres? Uh, yeah, atmospheres. Now, where would we get a pressure like that? We'd have to be below sea level, would we not? And where can you be below sea level? New Orleans. Where? New, New Orleans? Orleans. Uh, no, New Orleans is at sea level. Oh, well, yeah, technically. <laughs> if you're on the other side of the levee in, uh, say, the French Quarter, you are below sea level. That's true. Yeah. It'd be difficult to measure that difference because it's just a matter of feet. Um, to get this much difference, you might have to be um, uh, at the Dead Sea. Or, um, let's see, Death Valley. I think Death Valley is below sea level, too. But we can, we can find out using our conversion factor. See, we just flip it from this one to that one. Oops, what happened? Go back. Oh, there, okay. So now that's 784 millimeters of mercury, which is greater than atmospheric at 760. Okay. So it depends on uh, the unit of measure depends on how you're going to uh, how you're going to use the information. Right? So if we're in SI units, uh, before um, I, I said uh, pressure is equal to force over area, and the SI unit for area would be meters squared. The SI unit for force is a newton. And one Newton per meter squared is the Pascal. Uh, Pascal was a, a polymath uh, of the, let's see, when was he operating? Eight, late 18th century, I think. Uh, so he was uh, immortalized in this unit of measure. Now, why would we want to use the Pascal as this equivalence? Well, the nice thing about the SI units is um, they're interconvertible. So where does the Newton come from? We haven't even defined the Newton. And I'm showing you all these definitions, but when we actually work problems, we're gonna stick with um, atmospheres. I just want you to be aware of these things and you may have to do some conversions for homework problems or uh, on an exam, but um, I'll show you where the Newton came from first. Uh, square meters is easy, just measure that one. But where's the Newton come from? It comes from Newton's second law of motion. Force equals mass times acceleration, which means if you have a given mass and you apply a force to it, it will accelerate at a given rate. And acceleration means a change in velocity. So the units of acceleration are in SI units are meters per second per second. Right? Meters per second is the velocity. And then for every second, they change, either increase or decrease. So meters per second squared is acceleration. And mass is kilograms, of course. So the Newton is equal to kilogram meters per second squared. And because these are standard SI units, 
the interconversion can can take place amongst uh, almost all of the uh, metric system units. That's the beauty of using this way, the Pascal and so forth, because you can you can do interconversions if you have to change units, then it's easier to do it this way. The the non-standard units you may need a, a special conversion factor to get the job done. Okay, so let's see. Uh, that's the Pascal, and we've talked about one atmosphere. So uh, in this country, also many of the barometers that you'll see. In fact, mercury barometer is kind of rare these days. Um, if we could teach this class on the Greenbrier campus on the fourth floor in room 407, uh, there is a mercury barometer hanging on the wall. At least there was last time I taught there. Um, and it had two scales on it. One scale was millimeters of mercury and the other scale was inches. And as it turns out, <clears throat> the electronic barometer that I have in our uh, lab on uh, the Beckley campus in room uh, 138 uh, spits out at, uh, barometric pressure in inches of mercury. So one atmosphere equals 29.92 inches of mercury. And that's also equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. So if that's equal to that, that's equal to that, that's equal to that. So you've got three conversion factors there in one statement. We also have PSI, 14.69. Pounds per square inch is equal. So now we've got, we, we're geometrically increasing our number of conversion factors that we can use. So in the, in the lab exercise where we actually measure the pressure uh, in the bottle, we measure it with a tire gauge. So it's gonna come out in PSI. But the, the atmospheric pressure is in inches of mercury. And to get the total pressure, you have to add what you measure in the bottle to what's outside the bottle, right? And you can't add these two together because they're not the same units. So you've got to convert them to a standard unit. And I think I, the method calls for converting this one to atmospheres and this one to atmospheres. Then you can add them together, and that's your total pressure. Here's another one, uh, the bar. Uh, the bar is derived, I'm not sure how it's derived. It doesn't look like it's derived directly from the SI units. Uh, because this is such an, uh, an odd number. Yeah, technically, it is an odd number because it ends in five. But um, the bar is used in weather. Right? The millibar actually is, is what you'll see reported on weather maps. Right? So there's another one. Except that the bar is, is not given an equivalence here to atmospheres. But uh, 1,013 millibars, and this should have been placed up here, I guess, is equal to one atmosphere. So there you have your millibar equivalence to atmospheres. So 1.013 bars is one atmosphere. So they're almost equal, but not quite. Um, I used to use a piece of equipment called, a, well, the common terminology is a freeze dryer, right? Everybody knows about freeze dry. Um, strawberries in your Special K, they're freeze dried. Or if you're a coffee drinker, sometimes you may indulge in freeze dried coffee. I think the first one that was commercially available was Sanka. It was a freeze dried coffee. What you do is you, you freeze your product, stick it in a vacuum chamber and you take the vacuum way way down and then you apply just a little bit of heat to the product 
And what it does is it sublimes. It goes straight from solid ice to gaseous uh, steam, vapor. And that's sucked off. The advantage to that is it doesn't damage the cellular structure of your system and it leaves the more volatile compounds. Uh, well, maybe not all of them, but some of the, the flavor components are held intact. But the, uh, the measurement of pressure inside that chamber was in millibars. And I would get down to less than 10 millibars. I'd try for three or four if I could get it <clears throat> when running. And then you just had to have a good vacuum pump and a good seal on your chamber. Okay. So we can do these conversions. If we have 14.45 PSI to inches of mercury, there's your conversion factor. One atmosphere equals that PSI. I mean, even though PSI itself is a quotient, in this case, you've got the same quotient here as you do here, so we can leave them intact. Kind of like when we balance equations, if you have polyatomic ions on both sides, you can use those as balancing units. Same concept here. Right. So here we have a chained conversion. We could have just put this one on top of that one and it would have worked just fine. So that many inches of mercury is this PSI. Uh, millimeters of mercury to millibars, we just need the equivalents. There's one atmosphere equivalents and there's uh, millibar equivalents. And that's how many millibars. Okay, so there's our barometer. Uh, let's see. So if we want to determine the pressure of a mercury column 760 millimeters high by five millimeters in diameter, this takes a little uh, effort. So we need to know the density because what do we have to know? We have to know the force applied and the area, square meters. Square meters is easy, right? We know the diameter is this. We can do that conversion pretty simple, simply. But uh, for the mass that's suspended up here, we need to know uh, the height of the column. That's the height of the cylinder, right? Then we need to know the area of the cylinder. And then we need to uh, know, well, we've done that before already. Uh, and then we need to know um, the volume of the cylinder. Then we can find out how much it weighs. And calculate a force. All right, so I think I've got it. Uh, uh, this is our starting point at, um, let's see, 3.14. Where did that come from? Oh, that's pi. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Didn't even recognize it. <laughs> this is <laughs> pi d squared or um, five millimeter is the diameter, isn't it? Is that what it said? Yeah, five millimeter. So this is pi d squared over four. This one is d squared and this is two squared is four. Uh, pi, so that's the area. This is the height. And uh, these are conversion factors to, with the density to get us to how much does that column weigh? It weighs two tenths of a kilogram, which is pretty heavy. Which brings me back to one topic that I, I skipped over. When Torricelli was building his uh, barometer, why didn't he use water? Water's more common than mercury. And it should actually be easier to handle. Well, it all goes back to the density, right? The density of mercury is 13 and a half times more than water, which means you need a shorter column to make measurements, right? How tall would the column of water be if he had to use, make his 
uh, barometer using water. That would be 13 times as tall. All right, so that would be pretty tall. 760 millimeters, uh, which is 7.6 meters. So we'd say maybe probably 10 meters high. Right, that's a little unwieldy for a glass column. So he went to mercury because mercury is the only element that's liquid at room temperature. Now there's one other one, but it's a little, mercury was very common in those days. Um, the alchemists have been using it for years, trying to figure out how to change various things into gold and the nature of elements. Uh, they knew mercury and it was very, it was plentiful supply. So now back to our conversions. So now that we have the kilograms, um, we need to convert. Kilograms is a mass. It's not a force, right? So we need a, a conversion to um, a conversion to a force. So if we use F equals MA, and I, I didn't put that in here explicitly, but if we use that relationship, force equals mass times acceleration, then you have the mass uh, here, and you have to, in kilograms, and this is the acceleration of gravity. That's what that little g means. Right. So it would be uh, force equals mass times g, and g is 9.80 uh, something, something, something meters per second squared. All right, anybody who's had physics knows that one. So this is the acceleration of gravity times the mass in kilograms gives you newtons. So we had to calculate newtons using this times our mass. And that's our force here. This is the area, right? So the area now, we use this diameter times pi, and we make adjustments for the uh, conversion to meters squared. And there's our calculation. And it turns out that this is the, uh, actually we've made a conversion in here that's not explicit because uh, this value will be Pascal's. Uh, no, excuse me, uh, neuters per meter squared. Yeah, this will be Pascal's. And what we've done is we've moved the decimal place three to the left and called it kilopascal's. So we would have uh, 101,300 right, pascals would result from this calculation and, and we've done a conversion here to kilopascals just to save space. Okay. Uh, we are going to have to, um, to use up our buffer on uh, what is this Thursday Tuesday Tuesday's a buffer day so we'll finish gases on Tuesday uh, but I do want to get through Boyle's law at least so uh, Robert Boyle was um, often considered the one of the founders of modern uh, actually sciences but chemistry in particular in the middle 1700s he investigated the relationship with in gases of their pressure to their volume. And remember, we've got these four factors. And if you're going to investigate two of them, let them vary. Uh, one vary and you measure the other one, like one uh, independent variable, one dependent variable. Then you've got to hold the other two constant. If you let them vary, then these two, uh, you can't say anything about them. So we have to make these constant. So what he did was he just trapped a gas. And from that point on, this was constant. And then he maintained the temperature. Um, if he was living in a, in a British manor with, with a lot of masonry, then it's kind of like living in a cave. Temperature doesn't vary much. Um, or other ways that you can stabilize the temperature, just submerge your device in an ice bath, ice water, and it'll be constant zero degrees. 
Maybe that's why the standard temperature for gases is zero degrees centigrade. Uh, oh, that's another thing. Standard temperature and pressure. If you see standard temperature and pressure relative to gases, standard temperature is zero degrees centigrade and pressure is one atmosphere. Okay, that's just for gases. Everything else is 25 degrees centigrade, but gases is zero if you see standard temperature and pressure in a problem statement. Okay, now we've got temperature constant, moles constant. We can let pressure and and uh, volume vary. So what did he do? Well, he took, uh, I'll come back to the relationship in just a minute. He took a, a J tube, we call it. It's kind of like that straight tube that Torricelli used, only it's bent with the closed end is short and the long end is tall and, and the open end is tall. So we have this J tube. And it's filled with air. So he started putting mercury in it. Right? And it, it pooled up on the bottom here. And then it got bigger and bigger. And when it touched the inside of the J, that's when the gas is trapped. So now he's got a definite volume, a definite number of moles of gas trapped in the J, in the short end of the J. And he just keeps adding. First thing you notice was, as he added more mercury here, this one didn't come up as fast. So he reasoned that as he confined the gas to a smaller volume, it was applying more pressure, return pressure on the mercury and holding it up higher here. Right. So he measured the difference between them. Right. That height, uh, was a measure of pressure in millimeters of mercury. Okay, so there you go. And you can convert that to atmospheres, right? We've done it. And then the, the volume of the trapped gas was what? Well, this height times um, d squared over four, the diameter of the tube, which he knew accurately. So he could, he could calculate the volume, okay? And you can convert that to liters, right? If, we, if it's cubic centimeters, by the way, what's a cubic centimeter? One cubic centimeter is one milliliter, exactly the same uh, magnitude, one to one. Okay, so here's some of the data he got or what he could have gotten, right, and he plotted it. So um, actually this, this plot is backwards because what was he changing? He was changing the pressure by adding mercury. So pressure should be on the x-axis as the independent variable and volume should be on the y-axis as the uh, dependent variable. But you still get the same plot either way. So we noticed that as he gathered this information, actually went from the bottom up because the pressure is increasing from bottom to top, right? And the volume is decreasing. He noticed that they were inversely proportional. As the pressure increased, the volume decreased, okay? And when he multiplied these two values together, he noticed he got the same value each time. So Boyle's law, Simply put, is pressure times volume is constant. Now, when we do the experiment in the lab, we get some variability, of course, because of experimental error, but this is for an illustration. So whenever you see two variables multiplied by one another, the product of two variables equals a constant, is always an inverse proportion. Why? Because that has to stay constant. 
And if this one goes up, that one's got to go down to keep this one constant. It's just that simple. Um, the problem is, when you plot this, you get a curve. And scientists don't like curves if we can avoid them. Straight lines are much easier to use for predictive purposes. Um, so what kind of curve is this? Well, in fact, mathematical terms and geometric terms, that's a hyperbola, which means that you could go all the way out here as far as you want, all the way out here as far as you want, and it would never touch the axes. It would approach. It would be asymptotic to the axes. Uh, so what do we do? if we want to use this information. Well, look at your, let's see, is it going to go some more? Oh, okay. Before we do that, this is, this is one form of Boyle's law. Another form, Look at this. If that's constant, then if you start with these conditions, and that's constant, and you change the conditions, right? They're equal to the same constant, aren't they? So this is before, and this is after. Well, if that's equal to that, and that's equal to that, then They're equal to each other, aren't they? So this is, um, I don't know, for lack of a better term, this is before and after. If you know this, oops, if you know three of these numbers, and you haven't changed temperature or moles, right? That's the condition. Then you can solve for the third one. So if you know both conditions before you start, and then you change one of them to a different value, then you can solve for the third one, the, the missing one. What is it gonna be? Okay, so that's how you look at problems. You look to see, uh, is it as is right now? Is it state in here? which you can't solve with this one because you don't know what the constant is. But I'll show you later how to do that. But if you know before and after conditions, and that's obvious from the problem once you read the problem, then you can solve Boyle's Law using this equation. Okay? And here's an example, right? Um, calculate the final volume of gas when 15 liters at 500 millimeters suffers a pressure drop to 125 millimeters. So this is before, this is after, and this is the missing factor right here. So you know these two, you know this one, and you can calculate the third, All right? So you can rearrange the terms first if you want to, or you can just plug in the values and then solve for the unknown. Either way that's more comfortable for you doesn't matter. Right? Here we solved them, uh, rearranged the equation first, and then solved it and found that if the pressure drops to 125 millimeters from these initial conditions, the volume is going to increase to 60 liters. Right? So it's up four times. Right? Notice the, the volume has increased by four times. And what happened to the pressure? Four times 125 is 500. All right. So the pressure dropped by four times, the volume increased by four times. Okay. Let's see, I got five minutes. Let's see if we can get finished with Boyle's Law. Uh, Okay, I want to, it's just another example of problem solution. Okay, let's go back. I don't want to do Charles Law yet. 
there. Oil's low. All right. So when you did the lab on, um, no, you didn't. Did you do graphing? Te no, no, you didn't do graphing techniques. But if I had given it to you. So here's what you do to make a straight line out of the hyperbola. We start with that constant, that uh, uh, product equals a constant. And then what does a straight line look like? Right? In math class, straight line is y equals mx plus b, right? y equals the slope times the x-axis value plus the y-intercept, whatever it happens to be. So can we rearrange this to look like that? The answer is yes. Divide both sides through by v. Right? That v cancels and leaves us with p equals k over v or k times one over v. Y equals m x, right? There's your straight line. What's b? b equals zero. b is the origin. So this line passes through the origin. And if we plot it, like uh, say this, we have, um, well, in this format, one over V should be here, and P should be here, but it works either way. And if you plot it now, instead of a hyperbola, you get a straight line with slope K. And that way, if you're given, if you know the straight line, formula for that line and it'll be different for different gases. I mean, they're similar, but there are some variability. Um, if you know the volume and want to find the pressure, how do you use this? Well, if you know the volume to be 10 liters, you have to take the inverse before you can use the graph. So 10 inverse equals 0 0.1. So you find 0 0.1 out here. And you follow it up. There's your pressure, right? You can't just read 10 liters off of that graph because it's not built that way. Okay. I see that mistake all the time. Or students just throw up their hands and say, I don't know what to do. Uh, but that's what you do. Okay, so that's Boyle's Law. And we'll... Um, um, let me mark my, uh, we'll pick it up with Charles Law on 24, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 29, 9, 29, and we'll finish this chapter uh, next Tuesday. All right, so let me stop the share. Be safe and have fun with chemistry.